Welcome to the Doctors of Running podcast, where we, a group of doctors of physical therapy, discuss the art and the science of running and the stuff that we put on our feet. Today's episode number 109. I'm Nathan Brown. I'll be hosting today. Along with me, we have Dr. Matthew Klein and Dr. David Salas. We are really excited to be with you all today. And today we're going to be talking about something very specific in shoe design. We're going to be talking about some myths associated with this component of a shoe. We're going to talk about what they actually do, and that is heel counters uh, and how they contribute to the function of a shoe and overall upper stability and structure and all of those kinds of things. We'll be talking about the different kinds and, again, going into different myths and actual truths about what we know about them at this point. But before we do that, we're going to hit a couple other things, and the first one is something that we're always excited about. It is our time to talk about who we are supporting this month with DOR Giving, and this month David gets to choose our uh, organization that we are working with. And so, David, do you want to give us a, a quick tidbit about who that is? Yeah, so we're going to be giving away to Club West, which is a track and field program based out of Santa Barbara here. It's a nonprofit organization help providing access and opportunities for youth track and field. Um, they host a bunch of different events, including the McConnell's Ice Cream uh, 10K that I did a few weeks ago. Um, all the proceeds go to the Keeds, as I like to say. Um, they do have a couple of other facets to what they do, and they also do help support with some Masters athletes as well with some of the funds, depending on what they're able to do. So mostly for the youth and also a little bit of Masters support as well. Fantastic. Well, as always, we invite you all to join us in supporting or at least learning about this organization. Uh, do you have a website for them? If you don't, we're just going to drop it down in the in the comments. But DJ, do you have one on hand? Yeah, to be fully honest, I think they could probably keep it a little bit better updated, but it looks like it's clubweststrack.org. Great. So check out that website. You can learn a little bit about them. Uh, and we'll have stuff and information in our description of this episode. So please check them out. We're excited to be supporting them this month, and we invite you to support them alongside us. Okay, so as I said, we're going to be covering things related to heel counters. We're going to look at the importance of uppers. We try to hit that every once in a while because it's kind of the unsung hero of shoes in a world where midsole technology continues to evolve. Uh, we're going to, again, be talking about what sort of claims are either supported or not supported as it comes to heel counters. It's also one of those things and one of those components of a shoe that can really make or break a shoe for certain people because of how it might hit and rub on your heel or whatever. But in the light of that, that's what we're going to go down in the route with our subjective question for the week. And so we want to know what is one specific thing that you look for in a shoe that can either make it or break it for you? What is that component for you? So Matt and David, do you have an answer to this one? You know, it's a tough one for me because I tend to do pretty well in a large majority of shoes. Uh, usually when a shoe just really doesn't work for me, I can't really seem to pin it to one specific thing outside of the way it makes me feel when I run. And unfortunately, the most recent one was a shoe that I was incredibly excited for and it just didn't work for me is that one that you can talk about i was gonna say is it the that is one i could audios talk pro about 3? it was the audios pro 3 i That's was I like thought. so excited for it and it just didn't work for me i the ride was fun it just destroyed my lateral foot so yeah it did matt what's the make or break thing for you there's a there's a couple of them. Um, I think one of the big ones based on my Achilles and calcaneus is actually what we're talking about today, which is heel counters, which is something that I frequently comment on. If a shoe has a heel counter that's too stiff, and especially if my uh, haglid deformity, that little bump at the back, if that's a little irritated, a firm stiff heel counter is a no-go. Like, I can't even wear the shoe. And I've had that happen once or twice. So I was like, I can't review this just because I can't get my foot in the shoe and walk around it because it hurts too much. So... That's that's one of the one of the big ones that can make or break a uh, shoe for me. What's the other thing? Do you have something else? It's probably a super narrow, unstable midfoot, or like a really narrow last uh, shape or last. Mm -hmm. For me, I don't do well with really built up, really firm midfoot posts. Those I I, I just don't do as well with those. So that's that's always a little bit tougher for me. And Matt, do you want to talk about our sponsor for the day? Yeah, our sponsor day is Moleskin, <laughs> just because we're talking about um, 
uh, heal counters, which can, if in the wrong place, can cause some blisters. So it, it was the obvious choice to have them sponsor the episode. I'm just kidding, by the way. That's a joke. <laughs> They're not actually a sponsor. They're not actually. We wish. This was our attempt at making a funny joke, so you can tell us if we're funny or not. But we might have to be we'll more go- obvious. We'll have to be more obvious about it. Like the people for like the like people against heel counters, the organization for the people against heel counters. Yeah, we chose a Forget real it. organization. Yeah, Hopefully this is we'll a fail for that. That's <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, we don't cut cut things out of our podcast because this would yeah. be a great thing to just splice out. No, we, we do this live. We'll uh, leave it in there. It's no, we will. It's a, it's a learning That's experience. The point. It's fine. Well, let's get into our main segment. The reason that that we are making this thing in the first place, and the reason people want to listen, we're just going to start talking about heel counters. And let's just start, Matt. I'm going to just kick it to you, just talking about what are heel counters for people who might not know what that term means, and talk about some of the variations that we might see in foot design, footwear design. Yeah. So heel counters are the stiff, and they can be used many different materials. The more common ones is a stiff piece of plastic or sometimes cardboard that's placed in the back of the shoe. There's several different variations. More frequently, you're, you will find them in the actual part of the upper. Their purpose is to basically lock down the rear foot. Different people have made different claims about them. For the longest time, they were there for rear foot support. It was trying to stabilize the calcaneus because there's different camps that might think that if you stabilize the calcaneus, that's the most important part to stabilize the rest of the foot. That may or may not be true, but it's, again, just that rigid piece of plastic or other material in the rear foot that's supposed to give some rigidity to the upper at the back. There's a couple different variations to this. Uh, the one I'm holding, for those that can't see, which is the Skechers Go Run Speed 6 Cloak. This is a great example of a less common version, but it's actually coming becoming more common, which is an external heel counter. And that's where the inside, the actual upper, doesn't contain this. It's set on the outside. So you get a little, oftentimes a little extra cushioning from the, the mesh part of the upper between your heel and the stiff portion while still providing some rigidity. The more common ones are the plastic ones that are set in the upper. I'm holding the Fresh Foam More V4. This is a great example that you can't actually see it, but if you take your hands and grab the rear part, like and get not just the collar, which is that top part, but get in there a little bit and push around, you will feel this kind of stiffer material that oftentimes goes up to almost where it connects with the midfoot and the heel, that transition. That's the heel counter. Um, there's another variation. There's a lot of shoes that you've noticed that the heel counter has actually been a little bit less stiff. And you can get away with that when you have maximal shoes like the Fresh Foam More V4 because you get sidewalls. And these are actually stabilizing the foot much better. The other one I, I don't have which is a split heel counter. The company that's most that will, you'll most commonly see this is Adidas, like their Solar Glide series. David, you got one? Uh, yeah, well, it's pretty similar. Yeah. I mean, it's not a true split, but it's yeah. basically down the midline of the calcaneus and then absent right here. Right. And then hugs down the kind of more distal part of the calcaneus down the side. That's the prime X. Right. So you'll have ones that like that, where it's kind of like they're done a little bit differently to add some rigidity. Um, but the more, the other ones that you'll see is like the solar glide where you actually have those stiff pieces, but the rearmost portion is totally flexible and it doesn't extend. So you actually have two counters instead of the one enveloping the whole part. And obviously the final one is what David alluded to a little bit, which uh, probably best example I have, um, Yep. Would be the, why am I blanking? Oh, because I can't say this. How do you say this correctly? The endorphin pro plus. Thank you. Pro plus, <laughs> uh, which has zero. I don't know. I just blank, uh, which has absolutely no heel counter at all and totally flexible. Nothing, um, nothing, no stiff materials back there. When you have this, oftentimes you need to add a little extra padding that can create kind of like a pseudo stiffness. But yeah, for people that have issues with this, this is a great type of shoe because there's nothing that can push on your heel bone. I think one of the big distinctions that you you alluded to in there is that the heel counter is not the entire what we would call collar of the shoe. What you can no. see that wraps around your heel, that's called the collar. The heel counter is the ri- more rigid piece that's embedded, potentially embedded within yeah. that that heel collar. So you kind of talked about the the tail of the of the heel that yeah. might be sitting above so you, if you play with a shoe that you have and you want to know where does my heel collar go up to you if you can bend that foam area of the upper above that you know you can figure out how far down that goes but that's a right. different thing the collar is right. different than the counter right 
And that's actually a good point is that the counters, by the way, don't go all the way up. They are different heights. You'll find some of them that only go up partially, some that go up all the way, some that wrap all the way really far forward, some that are just kind of a small sliver. It's, again, just a stiffening agent in the rear part of the shoe. How big it will depend and what it what it's been designed for depends on the shoe and the designers and wow, my goodness. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what you'll see as you're moving forward on the foot towards mm -hmm. the toes, the, the counter kind of slowly fades out for a lot right. of shoes where it kind of goes at this angle until it disappears around the midfoot. And companies choose to keep those a little bit higher or lower depending on their goals. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what we'll dive into next. Right. Are there any uppers, you know, when you when it comes to traditional where it's embedded versus a split versus an external, are there any that y'all tend to prefer, um, especially you, Matt, considering that's kind of where your issue is? Yeah, the ones that I've really grown to prefer have been the split, but those are not very common. And the reason why is I tend to have something called the Haglin deformity that we'll talk about in a little bit, where I just put a little extra pressure on that back of that heel or calcaneus bone. Achilles has been a little stiff and pulling on the calf has been a little stiff pulling on the area. So I've got a little bony outgrowth. And really stiff heel counters can irritate that, but I've, I still sometimes like them because they give me the feeling of a better lockdown. Whether they actually lock down is a totally different topic that we'll get to. But the split ones are great because it still gives me that feeling of security while there's no pressure on the rear foot. But not a lot of companies do that. So it's actually been rare, but something sure. I'd love to see more of. Right. David, do you have a preference? Yeah, I'd probably say I like them to be a little bit more shallower sitting where they don't extend all the way up and they kind of just hug the back side of the medial and lateral aspect of the heel where they don't quite extend super far forward. I guess the best example that I could probably give where it has just like a little bit of rigidity, but I wouldn't still call it rigid. Like it definitely has like a moderate amount of flexibility would be, and really it's just an excuse to bring up the shoe because it's just a fun shoe, but the <laughs> Nike Alpha Fly next percent. So <laughs> when you take a look, there's a decent amount of flexibility, like, but there's still enough structure at the distal part of the heel here where like, it extends up about this high, sits pretty low, and then just kind of wraps right about here-ish, and then it's gone. So just enough to kind of hold the structure of the shoe in that region without yeah. giving it a whole lot of structure at the same time. And it's so going up like, like a thumb's width versus all the way up. Yeah, I mean, it still goes up a little bit, like especially down the Achilles line here. Yeah. But the other parts are pretty shallow. Cool. And then Adidas does that a lot too. Yeah, That's another right. common thing in the Adidas performance shoes. Nathan, what about you? You know, I actually usually do pretty well with a semi rigid heel counter. So one that doesn't, that has pretty decent structure that you find in most trainers. You know, if you're thinking about like the velocity from Puma or you know, the Cumulus from Asics, all of those types of heel counters. I tend to do well with those as long as they aren't paired with too much stuffing in the, in the, in the collar. So I think I just get, I feel like my, my heel gets lost if there's a lot of padding. So like the, um, the original glide ride from Asics had a very stuffed heel yep. counter and so it was just really padded and I felt like my heel got lost in there and it added to kind of the wiggle even though it was supposed to you know and we'll go into what heel counters are supposed to do and what they actually right. do but I I find that I like I like some rigidity I feel like it feels snug and secure uh, but it's got to be the, just the right amount of padding and that's probably my favorite, but I'm not super sensitive to them. So I, I do well with the gamut. I thought that I wouldn't do well with no heel counter, but I ran, you know, my best half marathon was in the Skechers speed elite, speed elite. that, that has no heel counter at all. And so I, I found that I do, I do okay. Pretty much anything, but for just comfort miles and getting stuff in, you know, I've been running in the fresh from for more, v4 and that yeah. that heel counter has been great too and that's pretty a pretty traditional one yeah so that's a but great let's, shoe, by the way i i agree i yeah. i have been really surprised i think new balance has has an interesting spectrum of foam experiences so you look at the fresh foam more v4 and it's really cush like squishy under your yeah. foot um whereas you look at their high stacked sc trainer 
and that is not squishy soft, but it re- the, there's a lot of compression to the foam. Yeah. You just get a very different experience between those two, and then you go into the Rebel, and you have a different kind of soft. They have a lot of different yeah. foam that they play around with that gives a lot of different and unique running experiences. Maybe we should do a New Balance Roundup. We should soon. do a New Balance I think Roundup. We have that, yeah. I think we actually have that on the docket, because... Yeah. They do, they do provide a pretty unique running experience in a lot of different yeah. shoes. So, I'm just upset that the Minimus line is not called the New Balance Fresh Foam Less. I'm so yeah. sorry. <laughs> let's, let's talk about some, some more interesting things than, than Matt's favorite jokes. Yeah. Just kidding. We love your jokes, Matt. You... But let's talk about what are, what are the claims that are made about why, why were heel counters designed in the first place? What are they supposed to do? Yeah, so the origin really came from the idea of, and some people are going to get on me about this, but I'm going to say it, the idea of controlling motion at the foot and providing support. So the idea behind stiffening the rear foot that much was almost the same way you would consider, you know, an orthotic or post or something like that. It was to really lock down that heel because that was thought at one point to be kind of the the. I don't want to say keystone isn't the right word, but it's it's kind of like a lot of people thought that was the origin of pronation or a lot of instability. If you could lock down the calcaneus, that would stabilize the subtalar joint better, and there would be less motion and therefore less injuries, which is not found to be true. We'll talk about in a second. Um, it basically, again, envelops the heel and it's supposed to lock it down. How much that actually happens is another story, as, as Nathan just uh, mentioned. Yeah. David, anything you've got on in terms of the philosophy behind heel counter design? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, if you're going down to the origins, I mean, there is that whole old school like school of thought where if you can control the rear foot, you then stabilize the midfoot and you can lever off in a linear fashion, which is very prominent in orthotic philosophy and kind of just traditional posting philosophy as well. Um, but I think there's also another philosophy of just literally stabilizing the materials, not even just the foot or ankle or anything independent, just giving enough structure to actually hold said upper up in that region. And then to try and increase the amount of area there that can now lock down and hold that structure around your foot so that you feel more secure, independent of any actual stabilizing mechanisms. Right. Yep. Totally. There's kind of that two-pronged approach. One is the right. shoe itself and structuring the shoe, and the, the other is how can this affect the runner? Can we do something positive for the runner? And Matt, you started talking about the kind of the keystone, potent, like the, mm-hmm. the philosophy that the calcaneal motion can be the keystone for the rest of the foot. Can you just dive a little bit into the mechanics of how rear foot motion and forefoot motion interact, how rear foot motion and motion up the chain interact. Can you just dive into some of those biomechanics? Yeah, it, it should be known that there's still, there's actually a lot more questions now than there are answers as we're, as we're chill trying to, to figure this out. There's a couple th- people that will claim, oh, you can control the knee or control the foot. You know, it, it, that's going to be very person dependent about how much those things are linked, but there is some degree of connection. So starting at the foot itself, so calcaneus is that big bone at the, at the at the rearmost portion of your foot. If you t- you know grab right below your Achilles tendon, that thick bone there is going to be your calcaneus. So that that bone actually can't, based on the subtalar joint, which is the joint that sits just a little farther ahead where it connects to the rest of the foot, specifically the talus um, and other joints in that area, the calcaneus can move. And one of the most common areas will move. It will move into a little bit of inversion, which is where the the heel is pointing inward. It can move into a little bit of E version where it's pointing outward. Um, there's not a lot of muscular control specifically um, of that outside of the, the Achilles, which is one of the few muscles that attaches on the calcaneus. Uh, or I'm sorry, the, the, that would be the gastroxoleus and everything that connects into there. A lot of other stuff doesn't attach there. So a lot of that motion as you land, it's the heel will lock, is connected and related to the midfoot. And then by proxy, the midfoot's connected to the forefoot. So you've got to kind of got this extended relationship. And the whole foot can go to move together, right? So if if a lot of these joints are really, really stiff, you know, yes, calcaneal motion is going to affect the midfoot, which will affect the forefoot. That makes sense. If you are in an inverted position as you land, the midfoot is also likely going to be inverted as well. If you are highly flexible, those things can also 
move independently, which there should be as with everything. You don't want things too stiff. You don't want things too mobile. Kind of sitting in the middle is supposedly optimal. Um, but if things move a lot, you can get calca calcaneal or heel motion and have the midfoot and forefoot be completely independent. That being said, as you land, what is supposed to happen is generally people land in a slightly inverted position, even out the calcaneus, mostly because of how the Achilles tendon and the calf are sometimes pulling. When you land, you're supposed to be able to evert, and that's part of that shock absorption mechanism. So as you evert, as the heel inverts, the midfoot should also be able to evert, and everything could, should kind of follow down the chain so that you can go into some pronation, so you can facilitate some shock absorption, and then get onto the first metatarsal of the hallux of your forefoot so you can pivot off that area appropriately and get some extension, which locks in some other structures, a big one called the plantar fascia, which is part of that mechanical transferred energy that goes from landing at the heel through the forefoot. And that's assuming, of course, that you are a heel striker or land there initially. If you land on the forefoot, things kind of change a little bit. So there are some relationships there. There's a lot of exploration and the answer is always, which drives our patients and students nuts, is it depends. It's gonna depend on a lot of factors about stiffness and muscle length tension relation, blood, muscle tension and ligament stiffness is gonna vary there. It'll That'll really depend um, but there is some relationship there and optimally things should be working together kind of in a chain reaction to facilitate motion forwards. The other right. thing about going up to the knee, um, David, you want to take that somebody else so I can have a break from talking. <laughs> you know, when we were doing an episode on heel counters, I kind of had a feeling it was just going to be like 80% just Klein, just no, come on. We take share. it for a ride. <laughs> no, like gotta, let him, let him just go. No, no, no. We got to share. <laughs> so what about the knee? knee and the heel i mean anytime we take a look at foot ankle stability motion down at the midfoot calcaneal inversion eversion pronation supination whatever's going on down there you're going to have some stuff going on up at the hip and the knee as well so a lot of it's kind of chicken or the egg or what's going on first where's the greatest instability lying but usually if you have what some people would deem excessive pronation or where you're landing, you're collapsing down, you have a lot of laxity through that midfoot and you're crashing down out onto the foot, you're, you can almost always assume that that knee up above is going into a little bit of a valgus and internal rotation moment from the femur above it, which is also an internal rotation of the hip also kind of collapsing in like this. So you get this kind of spiral motion going down and then the tibia is going to be a little bit external rotated too, but that's kind of going into more advanced biomechanics of this stuff. But um, really it's just a matter of taking a look at the bigger picture and just stabilizing all of the joints and just making you move the best way that you possibly can. I don't think any of what I just said is going to change that much because a heel counter is slightly different than another heel counter. Um, but if you were taking a look at it and we're generalizing a little bit, yeah, if you have a little bit of excessive motion going more towards that calcaneal eversion, midfoot pronation, you can usually infer some stuff up above going into internal rotation. Same goes for the opposite. If you're a little bit more supinated, calcaneal inversion, you're a little bit locked out, you're probably landing a little bit harder and you're probably going to have a little bit more jarring coming up, but you're going to be in a more locked out foot position. So you're not going to be necessarily pronating over. You're going to kind of be on that like lateral piece where you're kind of slamming a little bit. And then sometimes if people can get a little bit of lateral knee pain with that too, depending on how they're running terrain, they're running, if they're running on tracks all the time, um, right. another common thing to flare things up if you're constantly sprinting and hitting really, really hard corners. So, right. um, yeah, it all depends. I, th I think that this conversation about biomechanics is helpful in just understanding the philosophy behind some of the early development of these rigid heel counters beyond just the shoe design. So if you think about what Matt and D DJ were just talking about, where if the heel tilts in or out, the idea of the heel counter is that it's almost like a wall for your calcaneus. So that instead of just moving, the idea is this heel counter gives your foot a wall that it has resistance to that motion, whether you're rolling in or you're rolling out. And as we kind of just talked about, there's a little bit of complicating factors with that, where it's not just what's happening at the heel in relation to this wall, but what's happening at the forefoot is affecting it, as well as what's happening up all the way up at the hip is affecting what's happening at the heel. So that's the philosophy behind it, is it's trying to create these walls for your foot, which is also an extension of the philosophy of the development of sidewalls in a shoe uh, from the midsole. So you're having these differences in uh, approaches. So we'll get to some of that a little bit more later, but that's kind of that, that philosophy of what are they supposed to do? 
that are supposed to act as a wall for your calcaneus to slow the motion. That's the philosophy behind them. So if we start to look at the research and what you've read on all of this, Matt, um, what, what have you found about what we actually know about the effect of heel counters on what we were just talking about in terms of biomechanics? Because that's really what they're looking at beyond just the shoe. Again, it's structuring the heel. They're trying to affect biomechanics is the idea. So what do we actually know about what they actually do to our biomechanics? I'm really sorry to do this, everyone. I know we've just been talking about this stuff, but the evidence says... So, uh, yeah, for the longest time, yes, a lot of the research is saying, yes, this stuff can control rear foot motion. It stops that. The, the problem is that when they were measuring this, usually in a biomechanics lab with motion analysis, they were putting the markers on the outside of the shoe. So, of course, the shoe wasn't moving. Some very smart people decided to go, what's actually happening to the calcaneus during this motion? They did some really cool stuff where they cut holes in the counter and the shoe and put the markers through that on the Natural heel. To actually, yeah, to see what's going on. And what they actually found is the heel was actually moving independently of the counter inside the shoe. And they discovered doing an external measurement based on the, the actual counter and rear foot of the shoe was not accurately representing what the heel was actually doing. So those don't always relate, which created some problems. Now, they've done some further studies, and that's kind of the new gold standard, by the way, is usually cutting holes into the, he into the heel counter or into the shoe itself so you can place those markers directly on the skin because trying to, to run in a shoe without a uh, back portion is really hard uh, just because usually the shoe doesn't stay on, so it can create some problems there. Um, but some of the recent studies have found kind of mixed results where certain ones have said, yes, this does tend to influence it, and then others are going, no, it doesn't. So as usual, the answer depends and seems to be very dependent on the person. There are certainly positives, but for who it actually seems to influence, eh, it's kind of a little, that's another another question that hasn't quite been answered. And when you're saying that you're, some are seeing, seeing, yes, it's making an impact. Yes. That would, so sometimes the rigid heel counters are decreasing calcaneal motion, right? Yes, and but sometimes they're not. And is that yeah. between studies or is that, is that within one study? So like within it's, one study, is there variance between the people in that or is it between studies? That's a great question. The studies I've seen thus far has been, they have not seen that variation, but it's been variation between multiple studies. Got so it. So inter, some will say like inter, consensus, yeah. yes. Some right. will say consensus, so, no. Right. So it's inter-study rather than intra-study. Gotcha. As far as I've seen. If somebody has right. seen something different, please leave that in the comments. And, and I think just when you when you hear that the difference then goes to what are the how are they measuring it and what right. types of shoes are they using because i think what we should talk about right now is the influence of a shoe on biomechanics sure. outside of just heel counters so right. these studies who, that are using different shoes are getting different results and part of that might be because of what you're seeing in the rest of the shoe design so outside right. of heel counters which again are designed to change um, to secure the heel, which we need to touch on that more in a minute, yeah. to secure the heel, but also the one idea was to prevent calcaneal motion. What other components of a shoe are trying to aid with that component of a shoe design? David, the ones do you want to it, talk about some? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Klein talked about it a little bit earlier, but you've got different things like when you take a look at sidewalls integrated through the midsole, riding up usually in the midfoot region, kind of like right as you come off of that rear foot through the midfoot just shy of the forefoot some of these higher stack rocker shoes will have what we call a sidewall where it rides up a little bit on the midsole where it's integrated with the upper on how you lock down the shoe that in theory tries to keep you a little bit more centered gives you a little bit more guidance going forward and gives you a little bit of that literal wall that you can't really shake yourself off of as easily and so if you take a look at a lot of these high stack rocker shoes, you're going to see the heel counter extend basically right before that said sidewall. And they try to get it to where it's integrated really well from a biomechanic perspective that you're kind of like landing. Okay, now you're phasing out of this and you're phasing into this and try to make it as seamless as possible from the initial contact loading response through the mid stance, essentially. So yeah, it's just like sidewalls are great. Also just upper integration in general having a good lockdown and connectivity with the platform that's underneath you is huge because that will also change your biomechanics in relationship with the shoe. Right. Let's talk about that a little bit for lockdown. So 
I think particularly when it comes to shoes that are designed for racing, we're having these really rigid shoes. Name any carbon fiber shoe, maybe outside of the Puma Deviate Natural Elite, just because that one has a little bit more flex in it. But you think of the Saucony Endorphin Pro, you think of Vaporfly. 361 Hurricane, you think XTEP 160X 3.0 Pro, you think... <laughs> what sure <laughs> just throw on the deep cut carbon plated <laughs> shoes out there but you know we're, we're seeing these shoes with rigid um rigid wow rigid plates and then you're seeing a lot less rigid heel counters so how are they designing it why are these shoes designed without rigid heel counters if we're saying they might contribute to stability and securing the heel down and why is it important to secure a heel in the shoe, particularly for a rigid shoe like these, some of these racing flats, f- stacks, racing stacks. I, I have to admit that I was kind of aware of this, but of all people, had not really thought about the fact that a lot of the recent carbon fiber plated racing shoes don't have counters, or at least don't mm-hmm. have significant ones. Probably mm-hmm. what I would think was the biggest reason is you can save a lot of weight. You know, these thick mm-hmm. plastic pieces add weight to the rear foot and the entire shoe. So if you're trying to get stuff down, decrease that rate for racing shoe, that kind of makes sense. You might take that out and see if there's anything, any ulterior or alternative methods that you can use to lock that heel in while still dropping weight. Just realize the majority of these shoes have that, like don't have one. I think. Right. Are there any big ones you can name that like re- have like a really thick one? I think the thickest one that I can think of is the Endorphin Pro. I might be wrong in that, but the yeah, even the, even that one's pretty it's small it doesn't extend around yeah. it's fairly no. small a lot of them are more just reinforcement than anything they'll have that yeah. longitudinal line that goes up the calcaneus kind of like what i was saying with the off fly where it kind of the vapor fly down at the bottom the vapor yeah. fly is maybe the most rigid to that's the vapor fly next percent too yeah i think you're definitely right that might be the the most rigid one i mean if you take a look at the the new the metaspeed series even that that's fairly like I don't yeah know. no that's is another that midline one yeah, it is. There is one. It's just, but it's there is like, one. It it goes up the midline and splits off at the bottom, yeah, like we were saying. A lot of the other ones do. Fairly I think what I think what yeah, that I just accentuates. That. It just accentuates the reality that a heel counter is not necessary to create lockdown because yeah. some of these shoes lock in great. You know, yeah, like they I really do. I get like no slippage in that. But why do we care about lockdown in a carbon plated shoe like this? Usually, you're going to be running faster. Right. So you want the shoe to be attached to your foot rather than not attached because the shoe is only beneficial if you're wearing it. Usually. (laughs) I don't know if there's any research on that. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Not trying to slip up on my response, but that was good. That's a pun, by the way. Yeah, Yeah. Matt got it. Um, But you don't want to slip. Heel slippage is big. So if you have these real stiff platforms, very fast transitioning, a lot of pop coming off the forefoot, you're going to have some elevation of that heel. You're going to transition really quick and you're going to get off and you're going to really propel yourself. If you're not connected to that platform, that heel will rise much sooner than you want it to. And that can create a lot of problems. So that's why you see a lot of times like (laughs) the track spikes lock down really well. They don't take any chances. But you'll see some of the road shoes, like it takes a little bit while for some of these companies to really develop and get that lockdown dialed in. And that's usually the first complaint is like, and this was the thing with Hoka for a little while too at the beginning, that you're just getting a bunch of Achilles issues. And it's like, oh, well, it's a high stack rocker shoe. And if you're not connected well, you're going to have a lot of this going on, multiply it over a thousand steps over the course of a run or more. And then now you have an irritated Achilles and not trying to call out Hoka. I mean, there's a bunch of other companies that have that issue, but uh, it's all just about upper integration. And how many times I'm sure most of our listeners here at some point or another have had to relace a shoe. Yep. You go out, you go for the run, you just feel it moving around a little more than you'd like and it doesn't feel good. You stop, you put your foot on a tree stump and then you go and you lock that thing down a little bit more. You take a couple more steps and you're like, oh, okay, I feel good again this feels right. Like it feels like I'm not going to have anything suspect that's about to happen. So just having that connectivity with the platform that's underneath you is huge because that little small variance can really add up. And over time, if we want to take this into physiological parameters, that may impact your like running economy that may impact your torque that you're able to put down a few miles into that run or race effort when you're trying to really go fast. 
And that might limit you because of pain. I mean, you might actually cause an injury and then have decrease in set parameters because of things like that. So you just want to make sure that you're connected to the platform you're running on. Right. And uh, I think these super shoes are probably the pinnacle of thinking about the art and science of the stuff that we put on our feet because there is a lot of research done to design these shoes a lot of times by these companies. And one of the things that we know is that it's not just a foam, it's not just a plate, it's not just an upper that creates a shoe that functions well. These things, these shoes are designed in such a way that you need to utilize every aspect of the shoe so that you can get the maximal benefit that the shoe's designed to get. One of those things is geometry. So the amount of four foot rocker and even just the shaping of the heel and then the, the amount of flexibility in the shoe is designed very specific so that it can try to provide the most benefit. So if your heel is slipping out of that shoe, you won't be able to maximize the geometry and the roll that's going on there, and you won't be working on flexing the shoe within its longitudinal bending stiffness. If your heel is slipping, you're not, you're not actually going to be utilizing that stiffness to your advantage because you're just going to be slipping out of it, and your, your foot's going to be moving as though you're in a trainer. So it's really important to have a good lockdown in the heel for you to maximize the benefits of these shoes. So, you know, if you're going to go buy one of these shoes, one of these super shoes, make sure that it locks down well for you. Matt, what do you got? Yeah. The other thing I think, hopefully I'm not making an assumption, but I feel like all experienced runners can probably tell a story of where they got a heel blister, right? The, the heel tab or the counter just wasn't sitting right. You went for a run, everything felt good. And you look back and you're like, I'm, where's all this blood from? And then you find, oh, okay, I just rubbed my the skin of my Achilles tendon raw. It's gross. That's why I jokingly this episode saying was sponsored by Moleskin because I think we've all gone, all right, I don't want to stop running because everything else is fine. It's just my skin. Let's crack some Moleskin on there. So that friction, right? So friction can be a good thing. It can lock, it can resist motion, right? But when it comes to friction from excessive motion, yeah, skin doesn't usually like that. And that's where you can get irritation and stuff like that, like blisters and yeah. Mm -hmm. And even in this conversation, we're talking about heel slippage. I think yeah. that's where my issue with excess padding for rigid heel counters comes in. Yeah. Is because if this if this shoe is designed to really, you know, lock down your heel and squeeze your heel, but it's so padded, your foot can just move around and push against that padding. And that's I had I had a lot of issues with that first glide ride. Yeah. Sorry to just keep hitting on that shoe. Like I enjoyed it in some ways, but it was it was hard for me to get a lot of miles in because my heel would just go crazy and it was the combination of how much padding there was in the heel and then also what was going on in the design of the mid midfoot but it's it's important to get the right amount of cushioning so that it can lock your foot in but you don't necessarily need a rigid heel counter to get a good lockdown that's that was kind of the point that we wanted to accentuate there right there's nothing wrong with heel counters and they're going to work really well um, that is something I want to highlight that a lot of companies, some, not a lot, some companies have used to try to go, yeah, we realize that heel counters might not be working for everybody. So let's throw a ton of padding on there in the heel collar around the back of the heel inside, try to offset that. And Nathan mentioned there are a couple issues. So one, you know, that you can, it can cause a little, it's not necessarily stabilizing sometimes. It actually can, feels like you're just kind of sliding around. The other thing that often bothers me with that is that it makes the shoe feel shorter than it's listed. So bro both the glycerin, the Brooks glycerin GTS and the normal glycerin 20 both had that issue for me where they had padded the heel so much, I think to try to offset that ten the not tendon, the counter and provide a little extra protection from the counter for anybody that's sensitive to it. It made the shoe fit short and over the more miles I got in them, I actually got some mild blisters on my toes until it took me until I get, until my skin toughened up. So padding can be helpful, but it doesn't always fix things. So if things are, too, if you're getting, you know, people reporting, hey, this counter's too stiff, you might want to modify it. And I think, you know, again, there's nothing wrong with counters, but I think there's some alternatives that you can do to make them a little more accessible for a larger variety of people. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to like acknowledge you, Nathan, that, that the excessive padding, you're not the only one that has issues, as I found that a lot of shoes <laughs> end up fitting short because of that. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about a few unique scenarios. So what might be some specific conditions that people might have that could make a heel counter either a benefit or something that they might want to be weary of? Can I start with the weary things and David, you can, uh, David, Nathan, you can do with the benefits. Sure. Perfect. 
So since I complain about this all the time because I have sensitive heels, the things that can be problematic with the heel counter, the most common one is called a Haglund deformity, which I mentioned earlier. And it sounds really bad. They honestly need to rename that because it sounds terrifying, but it's, they're actually fairly common. A lot of people have these. And all that is, where's my, my do I still have my foot model? Nope. Yes, I don't. Um, so the calcaneus, and people are gonna, aren't going to see it if they're listening to this. The the calcaneus, the heel bone, kind of has a protrusion on the back where the Achilles comes down and connects. That little spot with excessive pressure there, either from pulling on the Achilles or pressure from other areas, that can actually grow out. And that, that has to do with something called Wolf's Law of Bone Remodeling, which, mean, which states that, hey, a bone is going to respond to the, the stress placed upon it, and that's usually going to grow into something. So a lot of people, a lot of runners will have something, some people always call this a, a uh, was it a pump bump, right? Blank stairs. Okay, let's move on. Um, <laughs> awkward silence. So I've heard it either called hack deformity or pump bump because the other group that will usually get this is anybody where, that wears like high heels because that stiff thing that'll push in there. So any, it's just a bone, a bony outgrowth. And it's not, it's not something you need to worry about unless it is so inflamed that it's now starting to cause you issues. You're no longer able to weight bear. This is a totally different thing. But yeah, a Haglund deformity is something you need to be cautious of just because oftentimes it t can be a little sensitive the bigger it gets. And also the bigger it gets, that means your foot might not be fitting into the counter because you might need something more flexible so it can adapt around this thing rather than just pushing stiffly into it, which can be a little uncomfortable like for me. Um, the other thing that you can get from this or that can, uh, sorry, not get from this, but be, have it be irritating is something called retrocalcaneal bursitis. For those that don't know, that's not just your Achilles back there. There is a bursa that sits in that area, which in some people can get a little bit inflamed. And when those bursa are fluid filled sacs that are normally supposed to decrease friction, but when they get irritated, they can swell up quite aggressively. And any pressure on that area can be very, very, very irritating. So especially if that pressure comes from a hard, firm surface. So retrocalcaneal bursitis or bursosis. Is bursosis a word if it's chronically irritated? Forget it. Never mind. So <laughs> the only reason I say this is my high horse because part of my dissertation is on, uh, is on tendinopathy is that oftentimes some of these tissues are chronically irritated. And itis means acute inflammation, but different story. So yeah, the bursa in that area can also get irritated. The other thing that can get a little irritated is something called post retrocalcaneal bursitis. Also, Achilles tendinopathy, especially if it's irritable and it's insertional, can also be something that gets irritated. That kind of goes into the other two because trying to figure out if something's insertional versus the bursitis can, can be a little challenging unless you have like some imaging or there's some other tests you can do. But insertional Achilles tendinopathy is the other thing just because that area can be very sensitive and irritating and having a firm surface against it can be annoying. Yeah, These are usually, of... yeah, the, the injuries and deformities and it's not everyone. I think all of the issues when it comes to the presence, some precautions when it comes to these rigid heel counters really come down to the pressure that they can put on the right. heel. So, um, you know, when you, th and you said insertional Achilles tendinopathy, insertional just means where the Achilles is going into the bone. That's where the tendon issue is, whereas what we call mid portion Achilles tendinopathy since sits in kind of the middle section, the, just the belly of the tendon, not Up attaching higher. to the bone. Uh, so I, I think, when you, when you think about heel counters, the other thing that is happening with design right now is is not just the presence of these heel counters, but also the shaping of, of the heel cup as well. So just because there's a presence of a heel counter and you have a, ha a rigid heel counter and you have a Haglund deformity doesn't mean you shouldn't get a rigid heel counter because some of them are going to have more of a, like a, a cup yeah. shape to the back where it's going to move away from the part where your calcaneus sticks out. Mm -hmm. I think that... The, the easiest example to see was back when New Balance was doing those, uh, like the 1080 V11. I, I do not like those heel counters at all, but they but they show them. They show that posterior curve of the yeah. heel. And there are other ones that are more, I don't know, appropriately integrated. Like, yeah, you can see with, with the Matt's holding up the indoor from Pro. You can even just see that there's kind of a cup that moves posterior a little more so that it might not irritate your heel even if it's there so uh, you know it's it, it's never a this or that kind of a thing but if you have those conditions and you put on a, a shoe with a rigid heel counter and it's bothering you it's probably why because there's a little bit extra pressure but you can find the one with the right amount of padding or the right shaping that even if it has that heel counter 
<clears throat> you you could still probably use it. David, are, you, are is there anyone that you think should reach for a shoe with a more rigid heel counter? What kind of benefit do you think, what kind of people you think might benefit from a heel counter itself? Totally. I mean, there's such a deep psychological component to running and competing, and some people genuinely do believe that they need to have a stiff and rigid piece of footwear on their feet. And if that's what they like and that's what they respond well to, then by all means, go for it. And so there's a lot of shoes out there that they do have these either external heel counters or stiff heel counters, pretty rigid platform. It's kind of like your traditional old school stability shoe, really. Uh, they're not all built that way, but a design similar to that, that does create a lot of that. Some people, they feel like they need that and they feel like that's most comfortable for them. Go for it. So there's certain populations that would genuinely appreciate having a more rigid heel counter present that they feel it and they know it's there. And I think that's also part of it, that they feel like there's a little bit additional security because they can actually feel and see some of these components to the product as well. Yeah, and I think that there's value there, especially given the fact that there is some conflicting evidence on this stuff. So if you're someone who fe who's feeling the, I'm going to use the word support, feeling the support from it, you like it, and it, it might be giving you what you need. So it, we're not, again, we're not in the camp of saying something's good or something's bad. There's usually a shoe that's going to work right for everyone, and heel counters definitely fit into that realm. And I think there's two of us here that work well with pretty much anything, uh, and... Matt, on the other hand, has some things that he's learned about himself that work well or don't work as well. I have one other, one final question, and this relates to kind of the overall heel lockdown and construction. This is a question that we didn't get to in our episode last week uh, where people were asking questions. And somebody asked the question, what is a lace lock? Uh, they've seen that term around and they just didn't even know what a lace lock this. was. That's so can, can someone explain what a lace lock is? Yeah, so a lace lock is essentially using the final eyelet of a shoe to create a little secondary loop that you now put a, the same piece of lace through there so that it pulls the material of that heel collar even further together for security. So like for this shoe specifically, I love the Craft CTM Ultra too. I have nothing against it. But that heel collar and the volume that was coming up there, it was just a little much for me. So I had to have a little bit of additional lockdown. So for the viewers, you can see this. For the listeners, you can't see this. But I'm going to put the shoe right here. So as you can see with the final eyelets, as we come up, you hit that one right there. And then most shoes have that second eyelet just below that one. Essentially, you're going to put, like when you're lacing a shoe up normally, you're going to go through that last one. Take that same exact lace, loop it right back through the next eyelet. That creates that little hole. Now you're going to cross it back over and then you're going to do the same thing on the other side. And then that creates like a little secondary eyelet that you can almost like an external eyelet that you can go and put it back through, cinch that thing right up and pull it up. So that's essentially what a heel lock is. So a lot of this shoe, it's like nice and fluffed up so you can get a nice little visual of it right there. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it works pretty well for a lot of different shoes. But what it can also do too is it can create a lot of tightness up front on the top of that ankle joint. And sometimes that can create a little bit of biting too. So sometimes what I'll even do is I'll just use the final eyelet and skip that one right before. So I'll just go straight to that lower eyelet and then not do that loop heel lock officially, kind of meet in the middle there. And then that seems to work pretty well for me. And Topo actually is a company that seems to kind of default to that to begin with. They so do. some companies like to just use it that way. And then if you want to go back to the more traditional way, you can do that. Right. That gets you back to even the conversation on appropriate tongue padding and how, kind of how the, all those things go together too. Um, there, there's what, what probably is easiest is to find a video of someone tying a lace lock and we might even have to make like a reel or something. So we can answer that question for people and refer people to it. Matt, what do you got? We will definitely have to do that. Uh, in our, in Bach and I recently reviewed the Puma, uh, what was it? Why am I Electrify. Trying? The Electrify Nitro too. Um, and was talking about how that shoe actually has a loop at the end already as the last eyelet. Um, a great visual for this, and yeah, we'll have to probably do a reel at some point or like a YouTube thing talking through all this stuff. Um, this, These were techniques that I personally picked up when I was working in running stores. Is I encourage people, don't be afraid to modify your shoes. And laces is one way. I know this is kind of off topic from the heel counters, but there is plenty of different ways you can lace the shoes to modify the fit. And... Uh, 
over at Run Repeat, so Jen Jacob Anderson, who I've talked with previously, has a really great visual on his website that we linked in the Thoughts as a DPT, where you can see all these different techniques. If you're having heel slippage, if you're having different need to change the volume, this is one area that the laces don't have to stay that way. You can change it, and there's all kinds of techniques to you that you can use depending on who you are and what your needs are. Absolutely. Sometimes you just got to lay down a sailor knot, you know? <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Nobody knows what it means, but it's provocative. All right. <laughs> well, there we go. I think heel counters is one of those things where it's been, the conversation has been, it's going to do this. It's going to control motion. Whereas refining is a little bit less clear and it can be a lot more related again, back to our comfort conversation that we hammer home all the time. And we didn't even talk a lot about, you know, the clear disadvantages of having a heel counter that doesn't fit your foot in creating those blisters in different ways. There's different spots that that can create those blisters, but just know that, that's a very real possibility as well. So again, we are thankful for all of you joining us on the Doctors Running Podcast. If you have any additional questions or topics that you want us to cover, we'd love to hear from you. We'll be continuing to do uh, the question and answer episodes over time just to field more questions, but we do ha want platforms for bigger conversations that, that y'all want us to talk about. And we've already added some to the list already. So please email us at doctors running podcast at gmail.com. If you have any ideas, we are happy to take those into consideration and fit them somewhere. I think we're scheduled out in our stuff through December already, but there are ways to move things around and, and get new ideas in there. So please shoot us an email. We'd love to hear from you. As always, uh, if you could subscribe and if you could leave a review of the podcast, just to let us know how we're doing, helps grow this podcast, helps keeps it free and allows us to keep doing what we're doing. We will talk to you all next time.